So let's talk. Let's talk for a second about something that I, I found very fascinating. I only learned it recently. So remember, I tweeted out, uh, you know, maybe a week ago. I was like, you know what I want? I want Amazon, but it accepts crypto. So something that like pretty much will deliver anything Amazon will through the mail, and I just connect wallet and spend whatever, right? And I was thinking in my mind, I'm thinking Ethereum, right? Because that's you know, or one of the EVM chains. Uh, or or all of the above, right? But probably not Bitcoin. I'm probably thinking that. Um, and all the Bitcoin people came back and were like, yeah, you just need Bitcoin. And I was like, well, no, I'm really thinking Ethereum because that's really what I'm used to for Connect Wallet. Um, but you could certainly do it with Proton. And in in fact, uh, a whole bunch of people came, you know, attacked me. All, all the Proton fans attacked me immediately. It was like, Storex! Storex is coming! Storex is awesome! How do you not know about this? I was like, I just, I don't know. So, uh, so tell me, so that, I found that very interesting. So, what do you know about Storex? What can you tell us? And why did they choose Proton instead of an EVM chain? Yeah, so there's a bunch of really cool up-and-coming dApps on uh, Proton, and they, they picked Proton. Many of them started building on Ethereum, um, and they, they, came, they all came from Ethereum to Proton because they realized that the model of their crypto would not work on the Ethereum chain. So they needed a faster L1. Um, they all had the same idea that they wanted to have zero gas fees because they want to grow a really large network. So they all shared this. It was really cool to see, you know. Um, was that what they, is that, is that the, the primary reason was zero gas? Zero gas, they... so several different things. They're, it attracted a certain type of developer that wanted zero gas. They wanted fiat interaction. So they wanted to accept credit cards or banking payment. You know, they, they, they didn't just right. want only crypto. They want to link your bank and stuff like that. They also needed some form of identity. Right, so they wanted to create an idea that you'd have a crypto account, but it's verified. So they all, a lot of them shared that idea that you know, when it comes to Storex, well, you know, I just bought something from Amazon last week, and it was actually a knockoff good. There was a seller on there that had print, and it looked really close to like the real item. You could realize, oh my God, it's like a, a fake knockoff soap. What is this, right? Um, and that's pretty sketchy. And and they can get around Amazon with that. There's no. Um, there's no kind of really chain of, you know, is this real Dove soap or is this real, you know, what is this product? And, you know, there are companies out there or chains out there like VE chain that are working on this, like that, that chain idea. But essentially, you know, what's missing is, uh, the notion of identity. So, uh, Storex, um, another cool one is called Snipcoin. It's kind of like a Facebook of crypto and there's, there's a bunch of other ones out there, but they all needed fast, free payments, integration into banking and fiats. And they also needed um, essentially, uh, you know, no gas fees. They didn't want to have gas fees because they want users to sign up that would have come from eBay otherwise or Facebook, and they want to start making transactions right away. So with Storex, isn't Solana or Avalanche good enough in terms of the gas? Because it's like pennies. So why does that matter so much? So from a user experience perspective, you know, are you going to go to uh, Coinbase or Metal Pay or Kraken and buy some Solana or AVAX and bring it to that wallet to start making the transactions? Because even if it only costs you pennies, that's still a very arduous kind of oh, experience. Oh, I see. So if I'm using if I'm using fiat on that site, I still need a little Solana. Yeah, and I that's mean, the problem. Yeah, I mean, if you logged in with your so your Phantom wallet or your you know MetaMask wallet. You need some coin to move, start moving assets around, right? And some systems, like centralized systems, have got around this by using the cryptographic signing. So sign a message, uh, and then we'll do it on the back end and off chain. But that's not true mm -hmm. crypto, is it? That's back to the C5, right? So what are we no, really doing in that case? Why not just have a regular web app, right? So um, that that's kind of the vision is that you could you could do it in the browser. You wouldn't need those. You wouldn't have those resource issues. They also wanted the user for Storex specifically to show up with a linked bank, a linked identity. So if you become a seller, uh, you essentially are verified. You can be a verified business. This not just KYC oh, but see. KYB, right? And so Storex. Sorry, I just I just got it. I think so. Yeah. Storex is basically eBay. So yeah. that's why, right, okay, so it's less Amazon, more eBay, but whatever, it's still kind of the same thing, so I understand. So they want, they need the identity for the sellers, they need the fiat, so you, so if they go with Proton, it comes with fiat baked into it, so I don't have to get uh, fiat processors on my end? Yeah, so that's what's cool about it, is the protocol is built 
uh, to handle uh, to interact with banks and payment processors. So essentially, in you know tr typical crypto world, it's just DApps, right? Maybe other blockchains in some ways, like uh, Cosmos or some IBC or something like that. But you know, banks was never really part of the roadmap, and that's one of the things that things that Proton was was different about was to say you know Swift, ACH. Um, you know, a different payment systems from around the world, they're all just protocols, right? They may need permissions to access or, or uh, different, you may need to, uh, to be approved to access these systems, but at the end of the day, it's really just sending messages back and forth between different systems. And that's essentially what blockchain is, except for the ledger is decentralized in a true blockchain, right? So being able to send a payment message like uh, pull some funds from a debit card or credit card or credit them or to to a bank uh, all of that stuff can happen on chain and that's part of what proton does so metallicus as a licensed uh, money service business and, and financial services entity we're one of the first payment processors on the chain but we won't be the last so we're onboarding other payment processors and other banks and partners that want to come onto the chain and the cool part about that is once you have a notion of identity and a protocol for linking uh, fiat you could link fiat with different, you know, a Coinbase, a Square, your own local credit union or bank. You think about that Plaid login window, if you've ever seen that, where it says, you know, link your bank. What's the decentralized version of that? WebAuth, right? Um, right? You link your credit card, your debit card through a platform like MetalPay, and now it shows on chain, oh, my MetalPay Visa card, or my Coinbase debit card, or my Bank of America um, ACH, right? And the ability to pull that is basically sending a message on chain to the payment processor. Hey, this is Marshall from his verified identity requesting $20, which is going to be turned into a uh, metal dollar or USDC or USDT or Proton. And essentially that money comes out on chain. Um, and that, that interaction is initiated from on chain versus the app itself. So instead of logging into MetalPay or Coinbase or, or you know an exchange, and making the withdrawal, you actually just do an authentication with WebAuth from the DAP, and it's it's talking right to your bank account. So that's the cool innovation that you know. And again, these are things that would require e EIPs or you know changes to the core chain to get this to happen on other chains. Because you need to, you, this has to be inside the core chain. Yeah, you can't just sort of build a, an app, a DAP that would do this on Ethereum. You could like Ethereum would have, but it, it's not. I mean. First of all, you could, but it's going to be, you know, gas fees, issues, contract right. issues. It's better if it's part of the core protocol, right? Like we could make we could make smart contracts for doing things that the blockchain already does, like sending transactions. But why not? If we really want it to be solid system, you know, the the things that are happening the most often really should be part of the core protocol. And then kind of the what could be future parts of the core protocol start as smart contracts and dApps and things like that. And right. maybe they never have to be, but in some cases, maybe they, you know, become part of the core protocol. And that's, that's how, you know, blockchain and crypto evolves. And, you know, uh, the last thing I'd love to kind of, you know, talk about is, is the, the bridging problem, you know, where what's happening with that, the billions yep. of dollars being lost, um, you know, financial institutions, they want to come in and get involved when there's regulations, when there's capability to do things like decentralized identity, OFAC issues on blockchain scare banks away, whereas decentralized identity on blockchain make, makes banks feel like, oh, we could follow the Bank Secrecy Act. We could follow the, we're not going to have any issues with our regulators and um, with, you know, in terms of our oversight because we can have all the same systems and better on the chain. But this, this bridging problem is a really big problem. And if the industry is going to go down into this direction, and Vitalik uh, himself recently said something about it as well, is this the is this the way that we're really going here? It's probably not. It was like an early V one, like a counterparty before Ethereum, right? It was, right. you know, not quite the right way to do it. But, um, you know, I and and this so Metallica started looking at this, and we we created a solution for this called Metal Blockchain. It's an independent blockchain. It's a what we call layer zero blockchain, um, and there's really only a few of them uh, out there. Uh, what layer zero? It's a relatively new term, but you have I've your heard it. yeah layer one you know which are like your Ethereum's your Solanas your Cardano's your Protons your EOS's um, layer two like your Lightning your Optimism they're kind of like a abstraction on top of a usually proof of work or older chain that's kind of slow to speed it up and then your layer zero which is a new thing which is there's only like you know four or five layer zeros 
Um, and that's like Avalanche, uh, Cosmos, Polkadot, Metal Blockchain, and I guess you could count Kusama as well, which is also a fork of Polkadot. There's only like five layer zeros out there, right? And the layer zero is to be a consensus mechanism for other chains to plug into. And I guess Litecoin is the original layer zero with Dogecoin because they mm. implemented merge mining to allow Dogecoin yep. to merge mine off of Litecoin. So that's the Litecoin is the original layer zero, but it doesn't have an easy way to do that without EIP. Whereas those other ones I mentioned, uh, Metal Blockchain included, um, it's part of the core protocol to be able to set up a sub chain, um, a chain on the protocol by staking yep. Metal Coin. And you know I think the the direction was wrong with a lot of these bridges where it's like, we're gonna wrap tokens on everything and then they'll come over to this other chain using oracles and bridge, uh, smart contracts. That's, it's just too risky because if you too connect- Too easy all, to trick. Well, it actually, amp, every time you connect another chain, you amplify the security vector, the, the threat, the, the, the attack surface. So can, chain A connected to chain B, connected to chain C, connected to chain D. Every time you connect a chain, if one of those contract, contracts fails or oracles fails, it can ripple onto other chains that have nothing to do with these other right. connected chains. And so right. I predict either we go one of two ways. We either go a way where we go the metal blockchain direction, where we start to look at L0s as a way to clone other chains, which is the what I call intra-blockchain. Oh, um, yeah. We go the inter-blockchain communication route, which is the Cosmos route, which is also kind of a good route or we go the third way, which is kind of like the Axelar bridge, um, or you know, unfortunately, some of the were other bridge, the um, what was a wormhole bridge, or other bridges that were exploited. And I think that's actually <laughs> so. In terms of security, going down the, you know, from the intra blockchain, which I think is the safest, where you have to hack the entire blockchain consensus mechanism to hack one of the chains versus just one oracle or one smart contract, to yeah. the IBC, which is kind of a standardized. Um, inter-blockchain communication network, but still has some risks, but is, is definitely more secure than the smart con everybody build their own smart contract and Oracle. And we'll just hope that none of these blockchains get yeah. too big with the bridges being too weak. Right? Well, the way the bridges tend to work today is, you know, you, you have some, you have, you know, one end on Ethereum and then somebody comes along with their, you know, tether and puts it into the bridge, into the smart contract for the bridge. And then, so now it's locked up. And then they just mint new tether on Phantom or whatever, right? But that tether, that that tether that was on Ethereum, like it hasn't gone anywhere. It's just locked up. So somebody could come and get it, or the person that runs that smart contract could just, you know, if they've got keys to it, they could just spend it, right? There's nothing that guarantees that that's, you know, that it's going to actually do the bookkeeping correctly between those two. Exactly, and and the problem is is that there's no uniformity for it. So you know that's what Axelar is yeah. trying to do. It's kind of like what Cosmos is trying to do, and I think Cosmos is the best version of that, the IBC. Um, you know, on Polkadot, it's it, it's just the economics are I don't think are correct. Um, you'd have to like rent, and who wants to rent to live? Yeah, I agree. Polkadot's theft. Yeah, agree. Cosmos looks pretty good though. We had the Celestia um, people on not, not long ago. They're building on top of Cosmos. So I got a little taste of how that works. So yeah, and, and I, Jay, I, like what, I like what I heard. Yeah, and one of the founders, Jay Kwan, is a friend of mine. He's, he's very smart. You know, I was watching him in the early days with Tendermint. They, they really have it, they have it right, you know. Um, they, they, I've been watching, you know, I was an early, I was, I guess, I don't know if there's such thing at ICO, but I was like the early Cosmos, right? Like I had early Cosmos Adam coins. I believe in the project. I think it's one of the best layer zeros out there. The, the best layer zero in terms of speed uh, is Avalanche because it's settling at 0 0.5 seconds finality. There is no faster chain for finality in all of crypto than Avalanche. And Metal Blockchain is essentially uh, a different vision of Avalanche where we, we're taking Avalanche and we're going in a different direction to say that um, you know Avalanche is great with the subnet chains it has, P, X chain, uh, P chain, X chain, C chain, which are the smart contract uh, staking and um, essentially, uh, uh, cross chain, um, like cross chain movement, cha sub -chain, subnet chains on, uh, well, they're called subnets on Avalanche. On Metal, we wanted to create, uh, to take the knowledge that we've learned with Proton and create another sub chain that is a payments chain uh, that's, that's native to the Metal blockchain that solves that payments problem. So I think Avalanche is, is really good. 
uh, but it doesn't have a good kind of payments functionality. You're still paying actually a very high gas fee, in my opinion, to you know this market cap and size of what it is. It's actually by ratio higher than Ethereum, right? So it's not always, but for the most part. So there you have a really fast chain. Fees are still pretty high. We just decided to go after this to improve upon it, but also this idea that um, that POW chains are about to make a major transition and uh, proof of work chains are about to, I think, start to go extinct a little bit. And and Bitcoin will carry that flag of proof of work, but for how long? Uh, in my opinion, things change and what coin market cap looks like one year and what people are saying one year is going to be dramatically different in crypto the, in the next year. And it's the one day equals 10 days factor, what I what I call it, where one day in the real world is like 10 days in crypto. So, you know, what right. next year, what coin market cap and coin gecko looks like, the technology, the public sentiment and kind of vision of where we're going is going to be so wildly different than 2022. And I personally believe that proof of work um, is really kind of a relic. It's it's very cool and, and started Bitcoin, but it really, really I really 100 and, you know, Bring okay. on the hate, right. right? Or from from people no, that no, are gonna. I'm not, gonna, I'm not that guy. Not, I know I it's not coming for you, but I'm, the Twitter people, right? You know, the Bitcoin maximalists. Yeah. You know, people are gonna say, you know, no, that we need it. Um, it's it's for security. It it helps. You know, uh, it, people. I've heard all types of ridiculous claims that it's improving the environment by finding greener ways to mine and things like that. You know, I'm sorry, it's an old technology. In the very beginning of Bitcoin, there was no value. The cost of the kilowatt hours to mine and the hardware and the main, maintenance of that hardware was the current kind of early crypto alchemical transmutation. It's 2022, 13 years have passed, the technology has evolved. Why is POW viewed the way that it is? Is because we have a little bit of a cult thing going on here, right? And that's okay. Um, it is its own kind of, you know, crypto cult of POW. And every chain has its, you know, beliefs and vision and, and way of operating. And I, I believe that POW has a future sort of like decred where it's not like it, it can be a hybrid proof of work, proof of stake environment. And you're using that to add better security. But I'm sorry, getting to a level that, you know, New York State is banning proof of work. Eight countries have banned proof of work. Um, somebody was arguing about this the other day in the chat room in a private group that I'm in. They said, you know, oh, proof of stake has all types of you know, implicate regulator implications. I said, not really, you know, show me one securities implication for the, the aspect of proof of stake, uh, being a problem in any country in the world versus proof of work, a regulation that, that prohibits proof of stake, um, or, or classifies it into a category that makes it kind of boxed in versus proof of work, which is banned, banned, just not allowed. In eight well, countries. but that doesn't mean anything. It just means the government doesn't like it. Well, which governments ban stuff all the time that they shouldn't ban. Sure, and and the government's you know supposedly bad and all, you know what everybody in crypto says. But you know, what what does why did the government ban it? Right, the government different reasons for different parts of the world, and some of those reasons might be um, because of the ability to move money and circumvent capital controls and other things like that. Absolutely, but. Uh, in most cases, like let's look at like New York State, for example, um, they banned it because of the energy consumption, right? It was it was 100 percent about the green energy. Really, consumption. though? Well, I think it's because they're New York State and they can't control it. And they're the center of banking and they just don't like it. I, That's my read. I don't think so. I think that it was I think that it's a you know, it is a uh, energy consumption issue. It, there are certainly people that will use that to try and propel that argument. Yeah, bad for the environment when the real reason that they don't want it is for, you know, other political reasons. Pretty much. Absolutely. Yeah, that's what I think. Absolutely. And you've seen the Masari chart too where it's like here's Bitcoin's energy use and it's this really small sliver. Here's airplanes. Here's uh cl drying clothes. And, and, and it's like gargantuan in 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 uh, respect in uh, relative to each other. And then show the rate of progress of Bitcoin technological innovation to airplanes over the past 10 years versus Bitcoin. And you're going to see this versus like this, right? Because right. this space is moving so fast. And the reality is, is that, okay, it's not a problem now, but if crypto really takes over and I believe it will, it will be a problem. And so, you know, you're, 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 we're talking about uh, climate issues. I just and don't think energy is evil. I just, I just, 
Oh, I, I can't I'm not get saying that. It, that. I'm not saying that uh, you know energy consumption is is evil per se. I'm just saying that we don't need it anymore. It's a it's a relic. It's a it, you know it's a it's a um, it's a Ford 1910. You know we it belongs in a museum. <laughs> And, you know, it's all, a barbarous relic. Perhaps. It's a barbarous relic, and and there may be some <laughs> things that we can. It is like gold. We were right. It it is like gold. <laughs> Pretty worthless, <laughs> right? Um, yeah. In terms of all the other assets, it's so. I think you know, and this is this is pretty obvious stuff, in my opinion. Being in crypto for as long as you and I have, look at the trends. Always look at the trends, right? I, I was watching a hilarious video on YouTube last night where this guy was reviewing TikTok videos, and he's like, "I don't understand them." But this is where we're going, right? And like, <laughs> that's kind of like how some yep. older crypto people may feel about proof of work. I don't understand how you could dare step on proof of work, tread on this this original crypto anarchist vision. But it's really not. That's really not the case. I, I think that there is definitely a lot of thought around that. That that really. And again, I, I think it's it's a little cultish, right? In my opinion, because. You know, you can use proof of work like Decred, the hybrid model to, to strengthen um, the consensus. But again, I don't think you need it. And so, so my belief is that ultimately cryptos in the future will be mostly proof of stake and other consensus mechanisms that are low energy consumption, that are faster than seven transactions per second. And you will have Bitcoin maximalists that will say, oh, this is the only true crypto. Well, I'm sure that, you know, VHS is the only okay. true way to watch movies, too. And you can do I that. I got it. But, um, <laughs> you and know. Let's move on because I think we, it's, we've yeah, beaten this, dead horse. We've yeah. beaten this, that, this horse to death. So true. moving along. So I, I want to understand something a little bit better. So um, you, you've got the, all these pieces. And I'm, I'm understanding it a little bit better now. But you've got Proton. That's your settlement layer. That's your main sort of front and center stage blockchain. Uh, there are new dApps being built on it daily, and some of them very interesting. Then you have Metallicus, which is kind of your fiat regulatory. I don't really understand that one as well. I do now understand the new metal blockchain. Let's talk about that one first. So that's that's a layer zero. That's That has a token, and it's is it up and running now? Can I go buy the token somewhere? Where? What's the state of that right now? It is. Uh, so the, the blockchain, the metal blockchain is live um, it, and uh, it has a uh, token trading. The metal uh, blockchain coin is not accessible via bridge yet. So there is a mainnet and a testnet running. Um, we've invited early uh, essentially participants through Avalanche and Proton and other networks to come and join in to start testing and, and get set up as validators. And we're getting ready to launch the bridge so everybody can access it. There's a wrapped token on uh, Proton called Metal, an X token, uh, similar to like uh, XBTC, um, that very soon that bridge will go live. So think of it sort of like an ERC-20. Um, but yeah, it is, it is trading live today on ProtonSwap uh, and MEXC, which you mentioned earlier. So you can get Metal on MEXC with USDT. There we go. And... Um, and so, you know, you can buy it today. It's, it's only a few weeks old. So it has one exchange listing and it has the DEX listing on Proton Swap DEX. Uh, and we're about to launch that, that uh, the mainnet of that. And that kind of the vision behind that is that intra blockchain, let's take the most, uh, you know, well known proof of, st uh, proof of work blockchains like Bitcoin, Ethereum, Dogecoin at the time that they really want to transition. And, you know, okay, a lot of Bitcoiners say, no, we don't want to transition. Well, pull, pull your group because there are people that do want to transition, right, to proof of stake. And um, same thing with Ethereum, obviously. There's a, there's a war going on, right? But it's mostly miners with the technologists. The technologists all want to go to 2.0, and the miners are saying, well, you can't take away this industry. And that's the hardest part is changing you know, an economy and an industry. And we're about to see what's going to happen with ETHW and the ETH2, which, you know, a lot of, very interesting to see. <laughs> but at this yep. time of kind of vulnerability where there's, you know, it's not really, it's looking kind of weak and the bridge hacks are wild, the wallet hacks are wild, Metallicus really wanted to solve these problems. So solving the wallet hack problem with web authentication, webauth.com. Let's start to have blockchains natively sign cryptographic transactions using the secure element on your phone. We actually don't need wallets outside of the browser. Those should be really kind of more like authentication services. And you should be able to do crypto transactions in Safari and Chrome without ever leaving the browser. And I hate when Wallet Connect like loses its connection or 
you know. Oh, I hate that too. Totally. Oh. I completely agree. So it should just be in the browser. I tap a button and I face ID and I just bought some crypto or sold some crypto. Or, oh, beautiful. Right? Yeah, yeah. No, it's totally, it's without a doubt. I, dude, I've experienced both. Without a doubt, I am a believer in your method of doing it. I, I, fully on board with that. Thanks. Yeah. Um, and and okay. metal blockchain, you know, that, that the vision for that is let's, let's secure the chains uh, through one intra blockchain communication where they're all under one consensus and they can move freely between each other without smart contracts, without oracles, um, and essentially bring Bitcoin and Ethereum and Dogecoin and other popular, what I call blue chip cryptocurrencies from proof of work to proof of stake and give them smart contracts and give them faster finality. And I'm not talking about like, you know, Doge chain where they did some airdrop and you know, some other coin or whatever. I'm talking about the original Doge coin, the original Bitcoin, the original Ethereum, right. a different vision. They're the same asset. They're trading at the same value. But here is a proof of stake version, a different proof of stake version than the merge. The merge is very cool, but as we have learned, it's not going to speed up the transaction speed. It's not going to give us faster finality. It's going to go from proof of work to proof of stake. So while that's happening, yep. a new version of Ethereum that actually does speed up the finality, going from 14 transactions per second to 5,000 with 0 0.5 second finality versus, I don't know, 10, 20 minutes uh, finality time, so, right? Yeah, so um, yeah. One, the one thing I will say, look, I don't, I don't, I'm not on the same page with you with proof of work in Bitcoin. We've established that. But what I, will, what I think where I am on the same page with you is all the people I talk to about thing, you know, things like stacks, all the people that say we're going to do DeFi on Bitcoin, you know, whether that's Lightning, whether that's you know, tokens on Lightning, whether that's stacks, pretty much all of them create another thing. And sometimes that other thing is a blockchain. Sometimes it's worse than that. It's not, a, it's not even a blockchain. It's like something even more centralized. And, and they have to create that other thing in order to make DeFi on Bitcoin. So it's never really on Bitcoin. It's just another chain anyway. So I, I'm like, why not just use, uh, you know, Ethereum or another proof of stake chain? Like, it feels like that's what it wants to be anyway. Right. Yeah. And, and I totally agree with you on that. You know, they where you go from, you know, and not to put shade on these other projects, but it didn't get that. It didn't get, you know, so a lot of maximalists are saying, oh, that's not really Bitcoin. Why don't we just use WBTC or XBTC or something else? We don't need yeah. we don't need like that's not DeFi on Bitcoin. So the maximalists want it to be. On Bitcoin, and that's why there's more love for Layer Two in Bitcoin maximalism than there is for, say, Stacks or something like that, because it's you know built on top of the chain, right? So th that's something that uh, you know the maximalist crowd wants. But you know, my vision is to say that um, you can have proof of stake versions, and some of them are going to. We're at a critical time right now in cryptocurrency where proof of work, I believe, is going to start to transition to proof of stake. Whether people like it or they don't like it, it's going to happen. It's just a conversation that's going to happen. The technologists are going to do it because anything that can be done in crypto, it will be done, right? So, you know, that's something that we've learned. So, that's going to happen, and I think through that, we're going to get smart contracts on Bitcoin. But it might be a different looking Bitcoin, although it follows the same token economics. It follows the same um, emission rate. It follows everything uh, in terms of what Bitcoin is. But it, it may be a separate looking coin. The the idea of this this other coin behind it, and I think that was kind of rejected, that in my mind was because it was a something that was targeted towards Bitcoiners. It was really specifically and I guess we're talking about stacks right now, right? But it was really targeted yeah. at Bitcoiners. You know, you like Bitcoin? Well you'll love this other thing that's not layer two, but it is another chain. And I think that it's probably just the wrong group to target in that way. And it didn't really, you know, I think it's, it has definitely taken off. And I, I, um, I really like Muneev and I like the vision and what's going on there. But I think that maybe it got that rejection because it was, uh, it was kind of like specific to Bitcoin. But I, I, in my opinion, it really shouldn't be specific to one thing. I think layer zero is about what, what we, and this happens all the time in crypto, what one developer or one community thought was going to happen maybe something entirely and completely different. And it happens all the time, right? So we thought that Bitcoin was going to be the new peer-to-peer -peer money, and it turned out to be more of like a savings or a gold type scenario than it was to buy coffee. I don't want to use gold or Bitcoin to buy coffee. I want to buy and sell it right. as the market moves, right? And so Agreed, stable, 
stable coins, right, merged. And proof of stake is kind of like that, you know, where in the beginning people are, oh, I don't know, but then you're going to start, you know, at the end of the day, if it, if it drives like a Tesla and it functions amazing, I don't care. Because the, when the mass market hits, they don't care of how the sausage is made. They care that it tastes amazing and they care that it works and it's secure and it's a great experience. So at the end of the day, I think that we are evolving from a proof of work to proof of stake world. Um, and, and how do we get there? I think that you're going to see proof of stake versions emerge of Bitcoin and Dogecoin and, and Ethereum and Litecoin. And we already know the Ethereum Foundation is, is building their own. You're going to see that's going to become really popular. And I think the best ones are going to, just like with everything in crypto, win out. Um, so, you know, I, I know, you know, we don't necessarily see eye to eye on proof of work. And, and some people will say, oh, I can't believe he's saying that. But, you know, at the end of the day, I, I just I'm a technologist at heart. I look at what's the best technology, what's the best experience yeah. and proof of work. It had a great place at a certain time. You we, know, get but, we get it. We get it. You, know, yeah. you're, you think it's moving on. Understood. Yeah. So, um, so the, let's talk a little bit about Metallicus. This is really the last piece that I don't really totally understand. What is Metallicus and what is its function in this triangle or triumvirate that you're creating here? Yeah. So we're we are essentially the core developer behind a lot of these uh, behind the Proton, the Metal Blockchain, also the uh, Proton Loan DAP, Proton Dex DAPs. We're essentially like a Google of crypto. Right. We are building a platform for Web3 for blockchain, but also for banking and payments. So our goal as Metallicus is not only building the open source software and blockchain technology that we think works with the, the modern tech world uh, and banking, but also as a financial services company to build a global digital asset bank. So imagine, you know, you see, you know, you see um, JP Morgan and Bank of America talking about crypto, but are they really crypto? The answer is no. Um, they are trying to not be left behind. They are trying to stay innovative. They will put on the front of their website, you know, we're entering the metaverse and they have nothing to do with the metaverse. And then you have a pure crypto company that's becoming a bank. It's the inverse. And in my view of the future, that these are gonna be the unseen explosions in a good way, where all of a sudden it's like, wow, where did these new banks come from? Where did these new fintechs come from? They came from crypto. They had to work 20 times as hard to get their licenses, to get their integrations than these other fintechs did. And they're going to be gladiators. They're going to be battle-tested gladiators coming into the world of banking that that just are completely different. Um, and so, so why though? Why, why do we need, so basically for fiat on-ramp and off-ramps, is that, and is that pretty much 90% of the value here or what? Yeah, so so Metallicus in building a, a global digital asset bank and the open source technology around that, um, we're, not a, we're not, you know, aiming to be a traditional bank that is trying to figure things out or, you know, do all these little pilots and things. We're actually building the real tech to do this. And so that's... It's it's very different where I think you, when you look at like um, you look at like Onyx blockchain. But the tech to do what? To essentially link fiat on and off ramps. Not just fiat on and off ramps, but to connect all uh, all fintechs, all crypto platforms from not only uh, the fiat interaction, but the merchant world, the traditional web experience. So you know, going back to uh, web auth and that that experience, you know, we want to evolve the wallets. I think we're in the AOL kind of day, right? Where we have yep. to, that's, Metallicus is evolving that, right? With the with the wallet products, also the exchange infrastructure. I don't believe that, I don't believe that we need centralized exchange anymore. DEX is the future um, and we're starting to see that, um, but there just hasn't been anything like the Proton DEX that has launched yet. There's DYDX, which I think is very good. Um, and they're yep. starting to, they're, they're having the same realizations that we had, which is they're going to Cosmos. We built our own, layer one and layer zero and they have their they're going to into the cosmos ecosystem um but okay i uh, still, still want to keep going back to like why a bank yeah. like other, other than fiat on and off and i maybe i'm just not getting it because i just i don't understand like and i get that you're doing a crypto native bank which we do need because there's a lot of banks that are either slow or they're um antagonistic to crypto so we i like the idea of a crypto native bank that's sort of building out um, but I, other than fiat on and off ramps, I don't know why you need that. And I, I'm guessing there's a reason, but I don't understand I, it yet. Yeah. So, so I, I can kind of break it down. Se several 
major areas. One, crypto is, is going to become, already has become a multi-billion dollar industry, but um, I believe is going to really start to dominate fintech and finance into the future. Um, distributed ledger, decentralized ledger, and you know what we see right now is just the tip of the iceberg of where this technology is going to go in terms of banking, in terms of finance, even in terms of Wall Street and, and tokenized securities and things like that. So you know, to go back um, to go back uh, to it, I think you know on the why do we need banks and crypto? And you, you, like you said, you know, you totally get it on the fiat on and off ramp. But there's so much more than that. First of all, if you're building a company, any company anywhere in the world, you need a bank account. You can't operate with pure cash. I mean, some small hot dog cart or something might be able to. But yeah. um, that's probably not a licensed business, right? Um, you're going to need a bank account. And, and it's law in most countries that actually you do need a bank account to operate a licensed uh, business. So you're going to need a bank account. That's just any business. Anybody, and every entrepreneur knows this. You have to have a bank account if you're building a business. Um, from a consumer standpoint, uh, we all also need bank accounts because we live in the modern world. So we have to have somewhere to store our fiat. We Most of us are not stable coin only to like prepaid debit card that accepts stable coins or stuff. That's like a really wild life to live, I could imagine. If you were trying, I think Laura Shin did a piece on it a while back, like living on crypto it was like 2014. It was like, wow, this is really, this is really very difficult. Um, yeah, you can't really do it. So you need bank accounts that can interact with crypto. And right now, if you withdraw, from exa for example, from like a Coinbase account to like a Wells Fargo account, they openly are telling you on Twitter, in their policy, we'll close your account as a consumer if you do anything with crypto. And that's a top bank. Okay. And, and most other top banks feel the same way. I, I know Bank of America, even though they say they're pro-crypto, they're not. They'll, clo they're they'll totally close not. your bank account in a second. Chase, same thing. You don't want to you don't want to call ba the bank and say, "Oh, I had an issue with my crypto transaction." You want your <laughs> bank account closed? Right. Try it. Call them up and say, "I'm having issues with these crypto transactions." And see yeah, if okay. you don't so get closed. Yeah, okay. Basically, it's a okay. crypto-friendly bank that's not going to be like a jerk about things so, just cuz you're touching crypto. Right. And they're saying they're become crypt becoming crypto, but they only say that because they're just hedging their bets. And yeah, you know, they, I and, totally agree. They're they're full of crap. And totally and, agree. and they will ultimately integrate crypto because it's inevitable. But if it was a choice, you know, like if we oh, they would totally not do it, right? <laughs> right. So, so, so you so you're providing consumer bank accounts, not just and consumer, bank. Cor yeah, corporate, yeah, exactly. So corporate, and corporate, and so how can an industry expand without getting a bank account? And if you're starting a crypto startup today, and anybody who's watching this knows, how's it going? Trying to get a bank account? How is that going for you? Yeah, yeah, I no, guarantee you, you are struggling like crazy. And if you did get a bank account, you're either very in the know or uh, your bank is very not in the know about what you do um, because right. that's the only way that you have one. Just walking out the door and going down to Wells Fargo and saying, hey, I'm crypto, uh, crypto exchange.com, whatever, goodbye, you're not getting it. And yeah. so it's like Silvergate that's pretty friendly to crypto, but that's you know one of the few. Um, okay, but first of all, Silvergate has a wait list right now that is, I think, like a year plus long. And if you can get yeah. through that wait list, did you know that it's a three million dollar minimum deposit at all times you must keep at Silvergate to have a Silvergate? It's actually did the most difficult. Sorry to say it's Silvergate, but if you're watching, you are the most difficult crypto bank to get into. Um, and that's <laughs> to say the other crypto banks are also extremely difficult to get into. But that's the highest bar is Silvergate. It's about like three million. I think okay. that that's what they so want. Let me just stop. So Metallicus offers banking reasonable. So if I want to keep like a thousand bucks in an account, totally cool. Mm -hmm. um, keep nothing I in can, it if you want. This, I mean, we, we don't like that. We don't like that, but, but you can have a zero balance. Yeah. Yeah. Can I access this today? You can access this today. So this is consumer. I can. Yeah. So metalpay.com, you, uh, you get your own bank account. And you know a lot of crypto companies out there got in trouble for saying this and saying, we're FDIC insured. I'm pretty sure they all kind of copied what I was saying. <laughs> and they're like, hey, that guy said it over there, so I'm going to say it. They got confused because FDIC insurance is when a bank collapses. And you know, until you're a bank, you can't say that you know, that covers your users in the case of Voyager. Turns out Voyager was just saying something that was completely incorrect entirely because what they had was an omnibus custodial account where they basically own everybody's money on a ledger and they keep track of it. When you open up a metal, metal pay account, you get a actual bank account with our partner bank. So um, in, in the US, that's Evolve. Um, in, in the, in the uh, EU, that's uh, Rails, uh, Rails Bank and uh, LHV Bank that we're partnered with. Um, and essentially, uh, that bank account is, if, if, 
if you went to that bank, you could actually make a deposit or withdraw with your account number, with your ID. And so that's what's kind of different about um, Metal Pay is you actually get a bank account in your name. Um, and that's different than a lot of fintechs where you actually have essentially a mark on someone else's ledger. Um, and so that's really important, I think. And that's a way that we built Metal that was a lot different than I think other platforms where it's kind of the more prepaid model where they own your money and they play with it in the background. Um, we felt like, okay, let's give everybody their own account. And as we go to build our own bank, we're same kind of vision where you have your own bank account. So having your own bank account, you can receive, and you can do this with Metal Pay. You can get your direct deposit into Metal Pay. Um, you can pay your bills with Metal Pay. Uh, you can, I, I pay my Apple credit card and we're soon to launch our own, uh, Apple, our own, um, Metal Pay credit and debit card product. So pretty soon you'll be able to do pretty much everything you can do with your normal bank account. Um, with Metal Pay, and uh, that's live in U.S. and Europe, and we're about to launch, we're getting ready to launch our uh, Metal Corporate offering, which is essentially the same thing as Metal Pay, but a corporate crypto offering, as well as our Metal B2B product. So if you're a fintech and you want to have Metal Pay under the hood, sort of like New York Dig, you can do that with um, with a Metal uh, B2B a API product. So kind of the full uh, consumer and corporate side for banking for crypto um, this, this industry can't evolve without banking. And if you can't get Agreed. a bank easily, a bank account easily, then that's a huge problem. And I can Got tell it. you that the top banks are not jumping out of their socks to give you one. And even the ones that are pro crypto are really struggling to keep up with the rate of onboarding because it's in many cases kind of taking the old banking model that doesn't understand some of these newer crypto businesses, their risks, their ways they operate and saying, look, we're overwhelmed as is. And you're throwing things out at us that we've never heard of before. So a crypto company that understands DeFi, understands dApps, understands how the culture works, community and innovation works, I think is much better than a bank that maybe doesn't understand that. So, you know, Metallicus totally is building the bank that understands your crypto company, wants to onboard you, and is not going to give you a $3 million, uh, um, you know, minimum. minimum. Or I've even seen um, some banks, and I won't name them, even charging outrageous monthly fees. That's not a deposit that you can, you know, pull out, but it's, you know, that's the fee to bank, which as a normal um, corporation, you wouldn't have had to have paid, but you're paying because you're high risk. Um, so that's also pretty wild. Totally get it. Okay. Well, look, we're at the we're almost at the hour and a half mark here, which uh, you know this is a <laughs> half hour to forty five minute show. So obviously, I'll, I I will have broken this up into two episodes, um, but I, I do think it's probably time to put a pin in it yeah. at last. Uh, we we both been windbagging it pretty hard, so uh, which is it's been fun, but it's probably it's time to bring it to a close. So before we go, um, is there any sort of last words you have that you want to sort of get on the show? I've started to do this thing where I say it on every uh, podcast and stream I go on. Um, people ask me all the time, you know, what coin should I buy? How can I make money in crypto and things like that? Um, the best investment in crypto is yourself, your education, learning how to code, learning how to work in this space. Um, so if you're ever wondering, you know, what to invest in, invest in yourself, um, come in and build in this space. There's no space like crypto and technology that moves this fast and is this welcoming to new people to enter. So um, invest in yourself and, and, and get educated in crypto because that's the ultimate reward. Super cool. Well, well put. So thank you. Okay. So this has been another uh, edition of Hash Rate. My name is Mark Jeffrey. Thank you, Marshall, once again for coming on. And we'll see you all next time. My pleasure. Cheers.